Good morning, and thank you for attending today's webinar on sanitary temperature measurement accuracy and selection. My name is Jennifer Adelstein, and I am the marketing coordinator for Industrial Controls. Bill Hopler, sales engineer at Industrial Controls, and Bill Burquist, senior applications engineer at Burns Engineering, will be taking you through the presentation today, which will take about 45 minutes. Everyone will be muted so we don't experience any outside noises that would disrupt the presentation. We will take some time to answer your questions after the presentation. Feel free to type your questions into the chat interface on your control panel located on the right-hand side of your screen, and they will be addressed at the end. We will also open it up to voice questions where you can raise your hand by clicking the hand icon on your control panel, and you will be unmuted so you can communicate directly with the speakers. At this time, I'll pass it over to Bill Hopler to get us started. Yes, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Uh, we do a lot of training at industrial controls, uh, classroom training, uh, training at customer sites. But we found over the past couple of years that doing webinars like the one we're about to do today have become very popular. Uh, we're going to try and go for about 45 minutes and then have questions. Some of the webinars that I've done in the past have been on paperless recorders, radar level solutions, gas detection, humidity, temperature measurement basics, and combustion controls. Now, the temperature measurement basics has always been a good one with good attendance, and this time we've decided to focus in on sanitary temperature measurement. We're being told by many of our farm biotech customers that temperature accuracy on their processes continues to be a critical measurement for both quality and compliance. And as you will see in Bill Burquist's presentation, there are many sources for errors in temperature measurement beyond just the accuracy of the sensor. So um, Bill, from, from there, please take over. Sure, yeah, that's a really good point. I have had lots of inquiries lately about how do we improve our accuracy. A lot of people have been using plus or minus half a degree C as their target, and they want to cut that in half now. and that's presents uh, even more of a challenge. So um, today we're hopefully going to go through some of this stuff and find out, you know, what, what's the best way to accomplish that. And the first question is, is why is the RTD really the best sensor for a high accuracy measurement? And, and we're going to talk about that, um, show how we select the RTD, and then I really want to go through a lot of these sensor errors. Um, and, and it's not only the temperature sensor that has error associated with it. There's a lot of things that go into the installation that can cause some fairly significant errors. In fact, even more so than what the sensor errors involve. And then at the, the end here, if we have time, we'll go through some calibration techniques. Um, the RTD, it, it's very accurate, it's very repeatable, and has a very stable output over a long period of time. And that's really what we want in any temperature measurement. And we're going to end up with e efficient production that's going to help control our energy costs. And that's all going to help us produce a consistent product. And then if you have that third party validation guy um, looking over your shoulder, it, it helps to have a good, uh, to be able to show them that you have a good long term stable measurement and you're producing a quality product. The, the first thing when looking at an RTD is, is to understand the two types of sensing elements that are available. The, the, the one on top here is what we call a, a wire wound sensor. Um, it may be called a coil sensor. And down in the, the picture here, there's a thin film sensor. Uh, these are the two basic types. The, the, the coil element is typically a 1 16th inch diameter ceramic tube with the, the uh, platinum wire coils installed inside of it. This particular one shows a dual sensing element, so there's four coils inside of this tube. Um, this is a, a photo of the actual coil, and this is a, uh, just the head of a, a push pin showing just to give you some size comparison. The wire is usually about 7 10 thousandths diameter, and you get a little bit of an idea how small the, the thin film sensor is. And the thin films are just a thin um, layer of platinum that's deposited on a ceramic piece, and then you use a laser to trim a path in it so that you end up with 100 ohms at 0 degrees C. And of course, as the temperature changes, the temperature goes up, the resistance of these devices increases and can be 
corresponded to a temperature. Now, of these two, the the wire wound sensor is going to have the best um, repeatability and long-term stability, and also the widest temperature range. The thin films work really well in applications where you need extra durability. Uh, it might be a moderate temperature range. They're they're rated for minus 50 to 200 C. There are specific uh, thin film designs that can go work outside of that range, but what we have found is that keeping it tight in that range really um, gives us acceptable performance for that type of device. But if you really want the best accuracy, best repeatability, long-term stability, the wire wound or coil style element is the one to choose. And the other nice part about the RTD is that you're not faced with using thermocouple extension wire. Most people just use either 18 or 20 gauge shielded cable. Correct. Right, next I wanted to talk about um, sensor selection. And I, I categorize this in what we call the four Ps. Uh, there's actually four Ps and an S, as you can see here. So we look at placement, protection, performance, and of course price is always important. Um, I'm just going to walk through each one of these and, and talk a little bit about each one of these sections. And the reason we're, you know, we want to make sure that we have a really good installation because that's just going to make everything a lot easier. Um, and as you can imagine, if you do it wrong, you have all kinds of problems, uh, not to mention wasting energy and money and coming up maybe with a bad batch of product. Now within these, if we look at um, the actual sensor itself, there, there are three main categories I like to look at, which is the interchangeability, the stability, and repeatability of the sensor, along with the installation, calibration, because you're, you're going to be checking the calibration um, during maintenance cycles, or you may be matching it to a transmitter, for example, or doing a loop calibration. Um, one of the areas that doesn't get a lot of attention is maintenance. Uh, when selecting the sensor, it's a good idea to make sure that it's something that can be pulled out of the process, um, easily checked, calibrated, um, or if it comes time for replacement, that that, that, that is an easy uh, process to go through. And then we also have the, the measurement system. In the instrumentation, you may have a transmitter, controllers, PLCs hooked into this loop. So those are all factors to look at when selecting an RTD. And our goal in this is to end up with the lowest life cycle cost. And that, of course, is going to translate to uh, reliability and accuracy of that measurement point. Two of the options for install installation of a sensor or where we're going to place it in the system is either a surface mount or some kind of an immersion style sensor. The illustrations on the left, this would be a, a surface mount sensor that would clamp to a pipe, for example. Um, well, this one could go on the side of a tank or a flat surface of some kind. And they're going to be measuring the, the temperature of the surface, whereas if we have an immersion style probe such as these two, uh, they actually immerse into the process. And there are some, some pluses and minuses to each of these devices. Uh, the surface mount, of course, it's real easy. You don't have to cut pipe or anything. You just clamp it to the outside, plug it in, and go. Um, you're not obstructing the flow. They're real low cost, which all sounds really good, but there are a few negatives associated with this. We don't have a lot of protection from the ambient conditions, um, and, and unless you have that sensor insulated, uh, you're going to be reading partial room air temperature rather than your process temperature. And they can be difficult to calibrate just because of their configuration. They're, most of the uh, calibration devices like hot blocks and other baths are designed for cylindrical type probes, quarter inch, eighth inch diameter, those kinds of things. Um, and then finally, you're measuring the surface temperature of the pipe and not actually the fluid inside the pipe. So at best, you're going to get an approximation of what that uh, temperature of the fluid is. Now, if we, if we go to the immersion style sensor, we can either have a direct immersion, which would be um, uh, the, the sensor just in, 
uh, installed directly into the process. Uh, we get a good fast response that way because we're minimizing the amount of mass of stainless steel that's around the sensing element. A fairly low cost. Um, you can get by with some shorter immersion length and still have an accurate measurement. Where they fall down is with durability and maintenance. If you have a situation where you have a high flow rate or a very viscous product, a direct immersion style sensor may not be strong enough to be used in those types of processes. And, and maintenance can be a problem too because if the sensor were to fail during a run, you can't just go out there and pull it out and put in a new one because you're breaking open the, the piping system. One of the ways to eliminate that problem is to the addition of a, a thermal well. So we'd have thermal well and a separable RTD probe. And so the thermal well would keep your process system closed up and you'd be able to do maintenance or replacement without um, opening it up to uh, atmosphere. Some of the, the factors to look at uh, when, when choosing a thermal well is the process connection, the pressure and temperature that it's used at. As, as the temperature goes up, most materials are going to have less strength associated with them. And corrosion or erosion, um, I know with, with a lot of pharmaceutical stuff, having metal particles in the final product is a big no-no, so you want to make sure that you, you select a material that is going to survive that process and not um, you know, become either corrode or erode away and end up in the final product. And of all the factors to uh, take into consideration for thermal wells, the uh, drag and vibration or, or wake frequency and strength is probably the most important in the area that I see um, more questions and issues surrounding. Anytime you put a uh, cylindrical object into a flow, you can have a um, turbulence forms just downstream of it, and that turbulence oscillates. And if, if it, the frequency of that oscillation matches the natural frequency of the probe, it can start to vibrate. And that's going to do two things. First, it's going to destroy the sensing element, and you're going to get a bad temperature reading. And worst case scenario, the probe could actually break off and go downstream and end up who knows where. And it's never anywhere good. So it's really important to pay attention to that wake frequency. And also, if you have a, a viscous product or a, a high flow that's going to cause enough drag on that sensor to uh, either bend it or break it off, there are calculations that we can do to assist people in selecting the right strength of probe slash thermal well combination to survive your process conditions. So um, again, thermal well makes maintenance a lot easier, protects the sensor, gives you a lot of strength. Some of the, the drawbacks there, it, it can slow the response time, although there are some specialty thermal wells that have some fast response tips and uh, special probes that go inside that can keep that time response down to a reasonable level. Um, somewhat limited by immersion length, you typically need a longer immersion length with a thermal well to maintain an accurate measurement. The next part is looking at the protection of the outside of the sensor. Um, a lot of Systems have uh, a periodic wash down. We're cleaning all the equipment. And you typically do not want to have uh, an RTD with its lead wires coming out of it exposed to that kind of an environment. And the connection head provides a, a, a good way to um, protect that sensing element from those wash down conditions. Most of the seals on RTDs are epoxy and against Teflon insulated lead wires. And it works really well for humidity, but if you get liquid water on that kind of a device, over time that water can migrate through and cause a bad temperature reading. So the connection has a real good way to help prevent that. Um, and as you can see, there's just all different kinds of sizes. There's uh, explosion proof, um, general purpose, aluminum, polypropylene, stainless steel, 
cast iron. Um, some have an epoxy paint coating, like is shown on the, the larger head here. Um, so there, there's a complete variety here. The real small connection head we see here, this is for, uh, it, it sees a lot of use in skids where um, real estate can be hard to come by or it might need to go in a real tight location. And there's actually transmitters that are small enough to fit inside of that. So if you have that kind of a situation, um, there are solutions for that. The heads make a real good spot to plug in a transmitter in the loop if you have a long distance of lead wire from the sensing element back to your control system. You may need to put a transmitter in there, or you may need a, a local indicator of, of temperature at that site, um, either loop-powered or battery-powered versions. And the connection heads, either this polycarbonate is the one that's shown there. And those are all uh, watertight. They'll survive uh, wash down. They're, they're NEMA 4, or I think the equivalent IP rating is 65 or 67. Um, so they, they, they do a real good job with that. So for those applications that <laughs> where a temperature well is needed, what would you say is the relative difference in time response from an immersion sensor without a well to a sensor in a well? Oh, okay. Well, the if, if we look at a, a typical quarter-inch diameter sanitary type sensor, we're going to have a time constant of about six seconds, and that's the time it takes for the sensor to respond to 63.2 percent of a step change in temperature. So, if we're going from zero to 100 degrees C. In six seconds, it's going to be reading 63.2 degrees. That, that's one way to look at it. And now, if we put a sensor like that inside a thermal well, um, this would be a standard thermal well that would taper from, oh, about an inch, uh, just over an inch down to five eighths at the tip. So it's a fairly substantial chunk of stainless. That's going to slow it down to about 22 seconds, 23 seconds. And if we use a heat transfer paste in that thermal well with the probe, that's going to cut about 40% of that off. So you'd be down in the, you know, the mid-teens for a response time. So it's a fairly significant change, and that, that, that can cause some issues if you have a process that's changing temperature rapidly. Uh, that thermal well probe combination might not be able to keep up to that, and you can have a fairly large measurement error because of that. One of, a, one of the specialty thermal wells we do has a, a tip section. Well, it, it steps down from 3 quarter inch to half inch and then to uh, 0.2 inches. And then there's a uh, sensing element design that fits inside of there. It, it's a removable sensor. And if we use the heat transfer compound with that kind of a setup, we get about a four second time constant with that. So like I said, there are potential solutions um, if you need a thermal well and, and um, need the fast response. Next, I wanted to go through and just look at some of the um, different probe configurations. Um, you know, before we get into the performance part of this, I wanted to look at some of these and just kind of let people know what is available. Uh, this is another, actually a standard version of a what is a fairly fast responding sensor. This one has a separable thermal well that's 3 16th inch diameter. And the, the sensing element installs, um, it's a spring-loaded sensor, it's 8 inch diameter that sits down inside of this well, has the um, sanitary connection on it. And this design uses a pipe union for uh, installation of the, the sensor. So if you needed to pull this probe out to calibrate, or if it were to fail during a process and you needed to change it out real quick, you can just break open this the, the union, pull it out, and put in a new one and keep going. So it's a fairly convenient way to do this. The same design um, is also available with a uh, another sanitary connection here rather than the, the threaded 
union. We, we talked about surface mount sensors and some of their limitations. One of the things that is available is a what we call a non-intrusive. And this is kind of a hybrid surface mount sensor. And if we look at the inside, we can see that the little sensing element is actually bonded right to the outside of this pipe, so we get fairly good intimate contact with it. And then there's a insulating material that's put around that. And then this outer protection tube of uh, stainless steel is put around that to waterproof the whole device so that it can survive the wash down. Um, we get a fairly good accuracy measurement with this. Uh, of course, there is still going to be the fact that you're measuring the pipe temperature and not the fluid. So it, it's certainly not a, a, a perfect situation. Now, one of the best ways to measure temperature in a small diameter line, and this would be oh, these elbow style thermal wells are mostly used in like one inch and smaller lines. We see a lot of half, three quarter, and one inch, even inch and a half lines. Um, and what this is is a uh, an elbow, and you can see the right where the thermal well is inside of this. The, the tubing is flared so that we don't get any flow restriction through this type of device. And then a variety of temperature probes can be used with it, either uh, with a cable extension, like as shown here or we could do a, a tri-clamp sanitary connection or a threaded connection to pretty much any quarter inch diameter um, RTD. And it, it, what this is doing is it, it solves one of the bigger accuracy performance problems, which has to do with stem conduction. I'm going to talk in detail about that later here. But there's it gives you the option of having a longer immersion length because we're extending the probe down the run of the pipe. And it's important to have the fluid flow coming directly at the tip of the probe. It keeps this area washed out. There's very little dead lag inside of this device. Um, so it, it, it's much better than just putting in a standard sanitary uh, key fitting, uh, you know, because typically you'd have a fairly large dead leg back in this area. So this is this is one of my favorite solutions for measuring temperature in a small diameter line. And if we have larger um, places, uh, a direct immersion, heavy duty sanitary part like this, it, it steps down from half inch diameter to quarter inch. And it also has a fast response. Uh, this particular one is a wire wound sensor, so you get the good accuracy and repeatability, and the time constant is actually less than three and a half seconds. Another version of a separable thermal well and probe, and this shows it the sensing element connected with a triclamp fitting. This thermal well is three eighths inch diameter, so it's a little heavier duty than the, the, the three sixteenths diameter we saw previously, um, and and it. it has a variety of triclamp sizes for connection to your process. This is a specialty um, sensor here where we actually took an 80,000 diameter RTD, welded that right into this uh, sanitary elbow and attached extension cable. In this case, it was a situation where really fast time response was needed and um, in a half inch, I think it was a three-quarter inch elbow fitting. Um, didn't want to restrict the flow a lot, so it's a real small diameter sensor. Um, so on a custom basis, uh, things like this can be done. For tank-mounted devices where we have a like a mixing vessel and they have a scraper blade going around, this style sensor mounts flush with the inside of the vessel so that this face of the sensor actually becomes part of the inside of the vessel where the, the, the mixing blade or wiper blade would actually be wiping right across the surface. The sensing element is mounted right in the very center here, um, provides a really good accurate measurement of the fluid in the tank. Uh, 
And then, of course, with a lot of these style sensors, um, the properties of the fluid are going to have an effect on how accurately they can measure that temperature. If you have fluids like water, uh, sensors like this work really well with that type of stuff. If it's a um, viscous product or if it has chunks in it or if it's and, – and one of the areas I've seen, if it has a um, – uh, I'm thinking of food and beverage type stuff where it has a high fat content that actually becomes more difficult to measure accurately. Um, but this does solve that problem where if you have a blade swinging around, you cannot have a, an immersion style sensor in the way. And then finally, um, with all of these devices, they're going to need to be calibrated. This model 12001 sensor, it's a secondary standard platinum resistance thermometer. And it's a laboratory device that you would use to do a comparison calibration with the process probes to check up on them to see if they're maintaining their calibration. A lot of different diameters available, eighth inch on up to quarter inch, different lengths, um, operating range of minus 200 to 500 C. In the next section here, I wanted to talk about performance and some of the sources of error. And there are, uh, you know, when we look at, a lot of people will look at just the sensor. You know, they'll, they'll, they'll look at the specs for the sensor and they'll say, okay, we got, you know, plus or minus a couple tenths of a degree accuracy from the sensor. Put it in the process and go along on, on their way and, and think that they're getting that plus or minus 0.2. And what I have found is that a big chunk of the error, in fact, I see more problems with the installation errors than with anything else. Usually the sensor is a, just a small fraction of what the total um, measurement error is, and a lot of it has to do with the installation. In addition to that, there's some other minor errors associated with the instrumentation and also the calibration of the sensor because you, there, there's an uncertainty associated with that calibration. Some of the other error sources that are associated with the installation um, are vibration. And that, that's one of the bigger ones that um, I see issues with. And to a lesser degree, mechanical shock or thermal shock, and of course thermal radiation can be an issue if you have a, another process running close by that's radiating heat and it heats up the external components of a, of a temperature sensor installation, that can cause a, a measurement error. Um, again, I see that stem conduction and the interchangeability of the sensor, those are kind of the two biggest error sources that I see. Um, one is sensor related and the other is installation related. Now when we're, we're looking at our, our error budget, um, we look at things for the sensor accuracy, interchangeability, if we're matching it to a transmitter or a measurement system doing a, a loop calibration, for example. And I'd mentioned the thin film or the wire wound sensor, looking at the specifications uh, for repeatability and stability for each of those. Um, so th those are kind of the main components of the sensor accuracy. And when we look at the total measurement accuracy, the installation is, is again, really important to look at. Time response, we've talked about that quite a bit. And we want to make sure both of these, that the sensor is repeatable and that our measurement um, installation is repeatable. Uh, I had one situation where um, I had kind of a mysterious error cropping up with a sensor that was installed in a, a sanitary line. Most of the time it would run okay, it was giving a good accurate measurement, and then occasionally it, it would start reading a couple degrees too low. And after we looked at the, the, the probe, the installation, uh, we started looking at the external environment and discovered that there was a, a fan that was being used occasionally to um, keep one of the 
operators cool and it was blowing on the external components of that temperature sensor and causing it to read too low of a reading. So the solution was to redirect the fan and not blow it on the sensor. And there we had um, that installation problem solved. So you never know where the problems are going to come from. Now one of the, the biggest um, sensor errors is this interchangeability. And it refers to how close the sensor is going to agree to a predefined R versus T relationship, resistance versus temperature. The two standards that are in use now are the ASTM 1137 and the international standard. And each of those has a grade A or a grade B uh, tolerance associated with it. And it's defined by these equations. So if you wanted to find out what the interchangeability was, you had a, a grade A RTD that followed the ASTM standard. Plug in the temperature here, it's an absolute value of temperature. So if it's a negative temperature, you just drop the negative sign, crunch the number, and uh, you know if this were zero degrees C, just to make the math easy, we'd be at plus or minus 0.13 degrees C for the interchangeability. Now the, the interchangeability represents about 85 maybe 90% of what the total probe accuracy would be. There's still the long-term repeatability to, to add into that, but this is a fairly good approximation of what you can expect for accuracy. And so what's the PT100, PT1000 designation? How does that relate to that table? Well, it would be the same. Um, you know, you would just move the decimal places all. And, and typically with a 1,000 ohm sensor, uh, since you've got 10 times the, the, the platinum being used, you're going to have potential for more problems with it. And really the, the, the 100 ohm sensors are probably going to have the best stability and long-term repeatability versus a 1,000 ohm. And I, I, I discourage using the 1,000 ohm unless there's some specific need for it where you, know, you may have a two-wire system and using a 1,000 ohm sensor makes that lead wire error a very small percentage of that total resistance. So that, that's really the only way place you'd want to use a 1,000 ohm sensor. Now when we look at the difference between the two standards, we can see that the uh, ASTM standard has slightly tighter tolerances uh, than the IEC standard. Now one of the the, the biggest installation error that I see is with stem conduction. And this table shows the error as a percentage of delta T. So if we have a you know room temperature 20 degrees C and the process is running at 100 degrees C, we have an 80 degree delta. And down here at uh, with with this particular setup, which is a tapered standard thermal well. We need to get out to about two and a half, three inches of immersion to nearly eliminate the stem conduction error. And by the time we get out here to about four and a half inches, it's uh, hardly even measurable anymore. And what's happening here is that this ambient conditions are, are affecting the sensing element by conducting heat along all the different components of the assembly including the lead wires that lead down to the sensing element. We need to make sure that we have enough immersion length to overcome that, that stem conduction or immersion error. A couple different ways to do that. We've looked at the, the um, elbow thermal well. And if you do it in a, a standard sanitary key like this, we have going in the outlet side, that, that's a fairly good way to do it. Even better yet, if you can put the probe down the run, this shows the flow coming up uh, up this direction. You do have a little bit of dead leg back here, which is not desirable. So this is really going to be the best area for installing a standard RTD into a, a sanitary key. And I, would, I wanted to just uh, show a quick calculation of what it costs to do uh, kind of a bad installation of you know maybe getting a, a, a measurement error and that the cost can be very significant. 
um, just for the energy involved. You know, not to mention what can happen to your product if you ruin a batch or, or uh, you know. So it just it really pays to um, go through the installation, make sure you have that correct, so that you get the most best accurate measurement, and that you're using a temperature probe that is going to provide that long-term stability and repeatability. The next two slides here just show a list of all the different error sources um, for RTDs. And I think this is a fairly comprehensive list. So you could use this kind of a um, takeaway here if you're trying to come up with an error budget for your measurement. And it can certainly help you fill in all the numbers for all these various uh, error sources. Finally here, I wanted to talk about service life. There's a, a bunch of things that go into calculating the kind of total life cycle cost of the sensor. And typically, the initial cost is one of the smallest ones. Um, it goes anywhere from operating efficiency down to uh, product loss if, if the sensor is not performing. The way we get there is to look at the, the application, the environment, and um, take all those things into consideration, make sure that we're choosing the right style of temperature sensor, whether it's wire wound or thin film, make sure the moisture seal is appropriate for that device. Um, there are sensors that are designed for use in steam autoclaves, for example, where we're pulling a vacuum and putting in steam, and um, that'll destroy a, a, a standard RTD fairly quickly. The um, spring loading applications for thermal wells. Uh, taking all these things into consideration that we've talked about, uh, it's going to help you repeat the original specifications for that probe during numerous calibration cycles. You know, and if we look at an analogy here of, of the USS Constitution, old Ironside, use high quality products, um, maintain it over the years, and, and, and it's still floating and still being used. So it really pays to. Uh, Look at all of these uh, different characteristics of the RTD and the installation. <clears throat> so finally here, I um, wanted to uh, talk about calibration of RTDs. And, there, and, the, and the reason that, uh, that you want to do this is that RTDs do drift over time. Um, and then it's going to be highly dependent on the installation. Things that can cause them to, well, before I get into that, I wanted to just show an example here of just the effects of temperature on the RTD drift. Now, most of the pharmaceutical processes are going to be, you know, less than 200 C. So as you can see, the, the error here after 1,000 hours at uh, at 200 C, you know, we're down on the point zero something degree C. Um, and that's going to be for the first thousand hours. This is a graph is also kind of a, a um, worst case scenario too. So the, the actual average drift is going to be about half of what's shown on this chart. So we're, we're down in the, you know, maybe point zero three as a, as a maximum number. So say point zero one. Would be a you know pretty typical number after a thousand hours. <clears throat> and you're going to see in some situations where the RTD would really not drift at all, but it, it there is that potential. So we want to check these occasionally. Um, and when we're looking at a calibration interval, um, you know it's it's something that you're going to have to. Uh, pick a number and check it and see if it's changed. And then if you can get through five of those calibration cycles without it changing, you can actually double that interval. A couple different ways that um, you might want to accomplish this. We can characterize the probe where we're calibrating it at several temperatures. You may use 0, 100, and 200 degrees C, for example. Or we can just do a quick tolerance check, which would be a, a check in an ice bath and, and compare it to the uh, R versus T 
that's in either the IEC or the ASTM standards. You know, one of the first things that needs to be done before you calibrate the sensor is to check the insulation resistance. And this is going to do a couple things. One, it will check to see if any moisture has gotten inside the probe, um, either down to the sensing element or up inside where the internal lead wires are connected to the external wires. Moisture in those areas uh, can cause shunting either between the, the coils on a sensing element such as this or between the lead wires. And electricity taking the path of least resistance is going to take that path rather than going through the platinum and you're going to end up with a low temperature reading. And this can also happen with other contaminants that may be inside the probe or could have gotten in there. But most of the time, it, it's a moisture issue. So doing this test first is really important. And at a minimum, you should do it at 50 volts. And we should see greater than 100 mega ohms between the lead wires and the case of the probe. The factory probes are tested at 500 volts. And they have to be greater than 500 mega ohms at room temperature. So if, if, if you see something down in the 1, 2, 3 mega ohm, that should send up a red flag because if it's at, at that low a level at room temperature, by the time you get up to your service temperature, it might be 120 degrees C for 121C, for example, it's probably going to fall way below the limits and be causing a, a temperature measurement error. The next step would be to check the probe in an ice bath. And this is a real easy to produce. Typically, we'd use distilled water to, to make the ice. Um, and use an insulated container of some kind. You can put a stirring motor in it. Um, doesn't make a huge amount of difference. But um, at a minimum, you should have this insulated container fill it full of crushed ice made with distilled or purified water. And then pour in just enough water to fill in the cracks in between the ice. You do not want the ice to be floating. And then use a, uh, you know, don't take your process probe and jam a hole in it to, and, and stick it in that way. Use another old probe that you're, that you're not using anymore, or some kind of a rod to form a hole. And then set the, your, your um, process probes in, in to measure them. The next way to do this would be what we call a comparison calibration. And this is just comparing the two sensors to each other, where we have a, a, a standard such as the model 12001. Uh, and you can do it at, at uh, elevated temperatures this way. Uh, uncertainties range from you know a couple zeros one to 0 0.01 degrees C. If you're doing this kind of a comparison calibration in the field, we see uncertainties down on that 0 0.05 to maybe a half a degree C. Um, looking at a, a typical comparison calibration setup, we have an SPRT here, which is the uh, a primary temperature standard, and the units under test here, and some. Uh, this happens to be a, uh, an AC bridge, and it's going through a switch box and back to a PC to uh, crunch all the numbers for each of those probes. Some of the equipment that's used from uh, liquid nitrogen, uh, various readouts, um, calibration baths. This particular one right here uses silicone oil, and it uh, goes up to a couple hundred degrees C. Um, Typical bath like that it has a stirring motor in it. Um, typically uses silicone oil. One of the more popular devices to use in the field would be a hot block. And you can either uh, depend on the display here for checking your probes, or you could actually use a uh, temperature standard in one of the holes and compare it to your unit under test. Another readout device for the uh, temperature standard. These are either uh, usually they can be portable or uh, benchtop style. And then there are factory calibration options where uh, the sensor can be matched to a readout device for the best accuracy, uh, multiple points. Uh, matching to a transmitter to get the, the, the best system accuracy. 
Um, in choosing a lab, look for accreditation. Check out their uncertainty. And then scheduling can be a big deal where we have, you know, you don't want to be without your, your, your standard or your process parts. Um, so just an inquiry about what, what the turnaround time is. And I guess with that, uh, Bill, I'll turn it back over to you and um, see what questions we have. Thanks, Bill. Very well done. Uh, for those of you that have our catalog or have access to industrialcontrolsonline.com, if you look at pages 901 through 933, shows pretty much everything we discussed about today. And so if you have any questions or any requirements for temperature sensors, RTD, sanitary, or the like, uh, most of our people that man the inside phones and those of us that go out to visit customers, we're very good in knowing the questions to ask, like Bill has gone through here today, to kind of keep you out of trouble and make sure that you do get the best possible uh, accurate installation that's available in the marketplace. So, Jen, with that, uh, do we have questions? All right. Thank you, guys. Um, yeah, so at this time, I'll, I'll uh, kind of read through the questions that we got through on the chat. Um, we did receive a question in from Andre. Um, he asks, can the RTDs be installed while the system is up and running um, and not drained? Um, you know, if it's a direct immersion style sensor, you know, typically the answer is no. Um, and and that's, that's one, one of the big reasons why you would use a thermal well. Uh, that thermal well is going to keep the process closed up and, and then you can certainly, you know, if you do have a, a probe failure or, um, you know, maybe it's, it's during downtime, but it's, uh, I, I know with a lot of the um, pharmaceutical industry, they'll have a, a process that's sealed up and they don't want to open it up because they would get outside contaminants inside and then they got to go through a complete system cleaning. And so that thermal well prevents that problem. And as you saw, there are just a whole bunch of different style thermal wells and solutions to, uh, uh, you know, to, to keep that process sealed up so that you don't have those cleaning issues. Okay, great. Um, we received another question in from Paul. He asks, what was the volts DC that factory uses to test the resistance high pot test? Oh, yeah, for insulation resistance, we use 500 volts DC. Um, and then our, our minimum insulation resistance is 500 mega ohms. And on, a, on the, the temperature standard, that's actually, uh, that number goes up to about 1,000 mega ohms. The, the error sources that you, that, that you see with that uh, really become significant if you get down below, oh, just a, a couple of mega ohms. The, um, and then if you get down into the 100K region, you know, well, less than one mega ohm, I mean, it, it can be because of one or two tenths of a degree error in that measurement. So it can be a fairly significant thing, but more importantly, it, it, it's telling you that um, you know, there, there might be an issue with that moisture seal on the probe and that you need to, to look closer at that to see really if it's, uh, if it's a problem. One of the characteristics of the insulation that are used, well, I guess any insulating material, is that its ability to um, do a good job of electrical insulation decreases as the temperature goes up, which is why we test at such a high level at room temperature. If you were to take that same probe and put it into, uh, you know, let's say we go up to uh, 400C, for example, measure it again, it might be 500 mega ohms at room temperature, but up at 400, it might only be 20 mega ohms. You know, it's not indicating that there's a problem with the probe. It's just that natural degradation of that insulating material as the temperature goes up. Okay. Um, actually, it uh, looks like we got a follow-up question in from Paul. Um, he wants to know, is this true for thermocouples also? Uh, they are less susceptible to those 
you know, any kind of moisture issues. I could think if if it's a uh, like an ungrounded junction thermocouple, and you had moisture in the probes, you may get some, um, you know, path to ground, but usually not a real significant issue. Okay. Um, we received another question in from John. He asks, what effect do the fluid properties have on stem conduction? Oh, yeah, I touched on this just a little bit, but what I guess what I have seen where we have um, products that, uh, well, for example, have a high fat content to them, and this is a, kind of an interesting little experiment, too. If you take a cup of black coffee and then a cup of coffee that has cream in it, um, the black stuff is going to, the black coffee is going to cool off faster than the stuff with the cream in it. And it's just, I think it's a heat capacity of the fat content. And that translates into making uh, a temperature measurement more difficult to do. So if we have, you know, uh, it, it, it tends not to, let's see, how can I kind of explain this as simply as I can, but it uh, has to do with the heat transfer characteristics of the fluid between that and the probe. And that's one thing that can cause some issues with it. The other thing would be um, uh, if you have a, um, oh, like a frozen product that's going into a mixing tank to get heated, and that initial batch of stuff that goes in, and it might be kind of you know, viscous and, and is not real liquefied, those kinds of things typically require a longer immersion length sensor to accurately measure their temperature. And again, it's just that heat transfer properties between that, that fluid you're trying to measure and the probe. One of the worst case issues I see is with air temperature measurement. And I had a, a case where there were several temperature probes installed in a, a ceiling for measuring air temperature. Uh, they, they stuck down below the, it was a suspended ceiling, and they were about five and a half inches straight down from the ceiling. And we were getting a fairly large measurement error. So it was a conditioned space, and then above the ceiling it was, it was warm. And it would read a lot warmer than what the actual room temperature was. Well, the situation there was stem conduction coming from the components that were above the suspended ceiling and affecting that temperature probe. Um, and the solution there was just to come use a, a longer probe. We actually ended up with a 23 or 24 inch long probe and come came down at five and a half inches and then put a 90 degree bend in it. And so they were suspended from the ceiling that way. And that eliminated that stem conduction problem. And it was because of the effects of, you know, that, that the air temperature just does not transfer its heat to the sensor very quickly and very efficiently. So, you know, if you did the same thing in water, you can get by with a three and a half inch immersion. So those are some, you know, some issues you need to uh, take into consideration. All right. Um, we received another question in from Steve. He asks, will a heat transfer paste improve performance of a surface mount sensor? Yes, that is one way to certainly speed up the time response. Um, you do get a much more intimate contact with the, uh, with the pipe surface. Um, you know, it can be kind of messy with a surface mount. Um, you know, you typically, um, the, the, the pace that we recommend is actually a, um, oh, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of like a toothpaste almost, and it's, uh, has a silicone oil carrier in it. And so you, you put it on a surface and it won't run or anything, but it, it can be messy if you're going back to uh, calibrate the sensor. You need to, to wipe that stuff off and clean it up. But it does a fairly good job of improving the time response and getting you a little more accurate measurement. OK. Well, thank you, Bill. Um, we seem to be out of time. Um, so just wanted to let everyone know that if you missed any part of um, today's presentation, uh, we will post a recorded version on our website. That's 
industrialcontrolsonline.com. Um, within the next couple of days, uh, we will email everyone a link to the video and our contact information if you have any further questions or feedback for future webinars. So at this time, I'm going to send you a survey link through the chat feature um, on your control panel. Um, and we would greatly appreciate it if you would fill out the survey and let us know what you thought about the presentation and provide us with recommendations for future webinar topics that you're interested in. Um, so I just wanted to thank everyone again for attending, and we look forward to having you back. Good job, Bill. All right, thanks.